This is Macro Analytics, delivering frank conversations on global macroeconomics and market analysis outside the mainstream, featuring discussions and debates between Gordon T. Long, publisher and editor of GordonTLong.com and his guests. The content of this discussion is strictly the opinion of the participants. It is in no way a solicitation for business, nor is it to be considered investment advice of any sort. Always consult a registered investment advisor before making any investment decision. These discussions are extremely hard-hitting and terribly frank, and parental discretion is advised. Now, on to the show. Good morning. I'm Gord Long with GordonTLong.com, and I have with me this morning Charles Hugh Smith, Charles is a well-recognized and very prolific writer on the web, who's also the publisher of the website of twominds.com. Good morning, Charles. Welcome back this month to Macro Analytics. Thank you, Gordon. Glad to be here. Charles, we talked about uh, doing a show in the in the new year, and we finally got to it. We've had so many things to talk about, uh, about this, the whole nature of work and the dramatic change that uh, both of us see that's in store over the next decade. And the type of employment, the growth in job. We always know things are changing, but I don't think everybody understands the extent to which they're changing. We'll be talking about this subject, I suspect, throughout 2013. And we've got about seven or eight questions here this morning. And I thought that we would just go through those because to answer each one of them is a show unto itself. If we could just raise these questions and have a dialogue on them, I think it would help to better see not only where we go, but why we see these issues to be so critical. And I think they start to answer a lot of the questions of what's going on with national debt, the growth of central banks' balance sheets because of some of the issues that they're fighting. And that is why they can't get any growth, why we have stagnation. There's many reasons, but there's also some very major structural issues that are happening because of demographics, because of technology, because of shifts around the uh, the world, labor arbitrage, et cetera, that we need to talk about. Any comments, anything I said there, Charles? I'm really looking forward to exploring the connection between peak jobs and peak government and peak spending and, and you know, the uh, as you say, the structural difficulties or challenges of our entire economy. They all go back to work because the whole economy is built on wages and income. Without wages and income, then there's 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 no money to spend. There you have it. Yeah, no jobs, no wealth, no wages, no taxes, and everything just spins down. So you've got to have jobs. And I would argue it's the rate of the growth of those jobs. And we tend to forget that the world now has close to 8 billion people. Since we tore down the Berlin Wall and the communist countries uh, came into the, the mainstream, if you would, we've added a couple billion people, ever mind the advancement of all of the countries into a middle class. And so there's been this huge labor arbitrage that we know that's going on around the world, and we all talk about it or listen to it, but I don't think we fully understand the magnitude of it. So the questions I want to raise here this morning are really structural. They're at that level of the structural changes. And the, and the first one is the advancement of, of technology, Schumpeter's creative destruction. How massively disruptive is Schumpeter's creative destruction actually today? Nobody talks about it. Charles, do you hear anybody writing about it or raising that issue? It's very rare, Gordon. You and I and maybe a handful of other people are, are on the bleeding edge of asking these questions. You no, know, the Internet and the advancements that we now have that everybody's familiar with today has become how you use it, what the knowledge is going to do, the, whether we call it apps or whatever, and that's advancing at a phenomenal rate. So today we've reached the point, Charles, where knowing something's not even enough anymore. That was, Knowing something was really important for the last 10, 15 years. If you did, you could create a company uh, like Facebook or, you, or Google, and they've, they've all suddenly appeared because you, you had something unique in the algorithms in Google's case of how to do the search. Facebook, how what people really needed and wanted. That's not going to change, but a lot of that's now better understood. Now it's your ability to innovate, to a creative idea that nobody's thought of, and to be able to use it, harness it, and and, and get it to market. It's always been there, but never to the extent today. That extent is so big and so large, unless you can do this, it's hard to find work. And as I've said many times, you know, how big is Google? You know, how big is Facebook in terms of the numbers of employees and how many new Facebooks are being created? So we're not creating massive new jobs, but somebody that can create an app suddenly can make a fortune. I would like to add a couple of points here, uh, Gordon, to your chart, which is um, it shows that what we really have is we have a global 
knowledge economy. Yes. And that, and so that, that, that it's global and you cannot stop it from being globalized because the internet and has enabled the sharing of any digital data and applications across borders. And so, you know, a lot of people don't like globalization. They say it's, it's hurting our economy and so on and so forth. You're not going to put that genie back in the bottle. And, um, there's just in- endless examples of that. And so, a global knowledge economy. And then the second point I, I want to stress here is that all of this technology that you've just described, it, it's not just um, in, in terms of like um, the Internet applications that we might be using. It's, it's changing the real economy. In other words, like farmers can now have, you know, tractors that are networked and uh, mobile robotics. And so it's changing the real economy, not just you know, the top level um, internet economy. Your job is not safe because there's somebody in the backwoods of Thailand who's got the tools and the the talent to be just as innovative and creative. So suddenly everybody's got the abilities today to chase the opportunities. And they are. The wheel is spinning faster and faster and people are getting more and more aggressive in doing that. This pace is absolutely global and I don't think we fully understand the rate at which it's picking up. And with it comes this massive creative dis- destruction. We're kind of overlapping here with the second question is, is do we actually have a productivity paradox going? Because the more and more this technology is advancing, yes, we're creating some more jobs, but not nearly at the rate at which we're obsoleting jobs. And additionally, how many more people are able to do those jobs around the world? And the chart at the bottom, the left, is just taking the stages I talked about previously. And you can see as we went through those stages, whole swaths of industries, of, of types of work that just completely disappeared and continue to disappear at a significant rate. The newer technologies that are coming on are not creating the jobs of the same magnitude. Um, and the same rate. And we talked about it in a previous show. Charles, you know, I live here in the greater Boston area. And I originally came here because of the technology. And we had DEC computer had, oh, two, three hundred thousand people. We had Wang, 150,000. Data General, 100,000. I can keep on going. And our younger listeners probably don't even remember these names. But the, these were the types of jobs that we had. But they were measured in hundreds of thousands. Today, we're still a dominant technology center, but now it's all biotech here. And we have some of the the leading biotech companies in the world, and a lot of my friends are at them. But even the largest only employ 8,000 people, and significant amounts of those people have advanced educational degrees. So what happened to the hundreds of thousands of people that were employed before? And by the way, our area continues to grow, needing more jobs. This is the flywheel I'm talking about. Are you seeing the same thing? Oh, absolutely. And I think that, uh, just to draw upon some even longer, uh, and back in history, uh, examples, around the turn of the 20th century, about 50% of Americans worked in agriculture, you know, the small, inefficient family farm. And then now approximately 2% of the population works in agriculture. And of course, it's, it's immensely more productive. And so that kind of, of massive destruction of, of manual labor and low skill labor is, is, is continuing. And, um, I just want to add like a, t- a technology name that a lot of people know, uh, Twitter, for example. I think it's, uh, headcount, total, uh, workforce is around 1300 people. Precisely. Less than 2000. And Facebook had about 3,000 uh, last time I checked, and Google has, I think, 10 or 12,000. So these are these are an order of a magnitude smaller than the the General Motors or the U.S. Steels or the Data Generals of the old days. One of the reasons it's been slightly camouflaged in the United States is during the last uh, 10 to 15 years as this has been happening, they've exploded retail and large box stores, etc., so that... You know, a Target store will have 250 to 300 people because it runs 24-7, three shifts. There's been a tremendous amount into retail, healthcare, and, and other services that have been very low paying, no benefits, and not the same high quality jobs that we had or had previously. So it's slightly camouflaged that. 
And with a 70% consumption economy, which I question whether we can continue, it does ring hollow whether whether we can sustain that level of retail employment going uh, going forward. And we're already starting to see some real cracks in, in that type of work. As we said, uh, Charles, we're not trying to answer these questions. We just want, we're trying to raise them here today as much as, as, as anything. The World Bank have really studied this, and they wrote a 600-page exhaustive report. And the bottom line of it is they came to the conclusion that the world, the globe, has got to create 600 million new jobs in the next 15 years to keep the system going. If we do not create net Okay, that's net growth of 600 million in the next 15 years. What are the chances, do you think, Charles, of us being able to do that with the problems we just talked about? In the current uh, conventional uh, context, uh, it seems impossible. But it, there may be other ways that we can create work, but it's not. It's going to be in a different paradigm than what we have now. Precisely. See, I will bet on people. I'll bet on the human species of wanting to improve themselves in life and taking care of themselves. I believe we as humans will have always survive. We will adapt and we will quickly adapt that will allow us to survive, to support a family. And in spite of what the status quo thinks it is, people will be by the necessity of it. So we will change. That's the kinds of the change we're going to see over the uh, the next 10 years. Another issue we're facing, Charles, is, and I've kind of mentioned it before is the since the Iron Curtain came down, the amount of people that are looking and, and now rising up to the middle class. And for example, we have 50 million people a year in China, in Asia, that are effectively moving from an urban or from a, an agricultural environment to an urban environment, expecting to find work, expecting to find jobs. That that is a staggering amount of people, and it's not just unique to China. I just happen to have uh, know what those uh, those numbers are. But as they arrive, and and they're looking for work, and you remember in 2007, 2008, when we had the crushing financial crisis, I don't think many understood that Christmas of 2008, there were 28 million people laid off in China. I was, they were, they were, they were so concerned. They had armed guards at the train station after the Chinese New Year's because they weren't going to have work coming back um, on the cross. That's the magnitude of problem that they face when there's a slowing down. We need to understand that we've had 46,000 factories leave North America and, and go to Asia over the last 10 to 12 years. But factories themselves are requiring less and less labor as we go to more and more advanced robotics. We've already went through things like Kanban, JIT, pull systems, all sorts of technologies, and that's continuing to accelerate as, frankly, we move to lights out factory, 3D printing. So you're seeing jobs in China leaving as they migrate, for example, in textiles where there's more labor content all the way down the food chain to other countries. How long does that continue to go? That's called global labor arbitrage. You know, at, at some point, it stops. And I think that migration is quickly uh, that those job migrations down the um, the to other countries that are lower paying is quickly running its course right now. And and manufacturing jobs are not being created at the rate that they were. So it's going to cause huge other kinds of problems. We're we're looking at like this urbanization that you um, your graphic shows, and I think that's a global phenomenon because of course it's really hard to generate cash in a small isolated village. And so the, the the only way to get a job that generates cash is to move to a city or uh, you know an urban zone, and so we we can't blame people for doing that. Um, but I think that the um, the the networking, the inner the globalization via the internet may be opening opportunities for people that live in um, rural settings to enter the cash economy, and that be maybe one trend we can start looking for. A trend that will happen, Charles. Yeah, I think that migration will slow. I not necessarily totally reverse, but the jobs are going to be you're going to be able to enter, as you call a cash society, without necessarily being in an urban center. The days of commuting are going to start to slow and end. I in a large scale, I'm talking about. That's right, a global scale, and and the demographics are interesting because, as we know, that. Um, China, like uh, the developed world, has an aging population, and so that's another 
kind of layer that we'll probably discuss in another program that as the population ages, then the, the mix of jobs you, you need and that people can perform, that also changes. And um, I, the, the last um, point I, I think about when we look at Asia and um, the, there's this huge migration we're talking about and the need for massive numbers of jobs is, you know, there's this food chain that's, that you mentioned in the global label, uh, labor arbitrage in which, you know, if the factory worker in China used to be paid about $150 uh, U.S. dollars in uh, a month and, and, and now it's about 300 So wages have, have doubled in, in a few years as the demands and expectations of the workers have risen and so on. And so you've got this sort of uh, vice, you know, that there's um, fewer jobs being created that are paying more money. But, uh, there's less need for, uh, there's less need for, for jobs at, at $150 a, a month. In other words, there's fewer people that are willing to work for that. And, and the skill level of the, of the workforce is rising. And so then those really low skill jobs are, might have to migrate to some other place. And we, I think we're running out of places. <laughs> Precisely my point too. Exactly. We're running out of places. The United States is a 70% consumption economy. Is that realistic? Have we reached the point of peak consumption and that 70% in fact is too large a consumption ratio for any country, especially where we got a crushed middle class, shrinking disposable incomes, jobs is for all the reasons we've just uh, described, um, that are, that are in certainly in peril in the, in the short term. And with the United States being 25% of the global economy and having been till very recently the engine, a slowing U.S. consumer is a serious problem. And we're seeing that with GDP growth that's been steadily falling in real terms. And effectively, we had a proper deflator, I would say, shrinking for quite a number of years. So there's another huge issue that the global engine itself is is stalled. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, uh, Gordon. And I think that it, this goes back to the point you raised earlier, which was key, which was the erosion of, of good jobs and, and the replacement of high paying jobs with lower paying jobs with fewer benefits. And so the, the, that's a key point that, you know, when we look at the statistics and, and uh, the government says, oh, there's 140 million people, you know, with jobs in the U.S. Well, if 20 million full-time jobs have been replaced with, with low pay, no benefit part-time jobs, that the, the number of jobs looks the same, but the amount of wages being generated is considerably less. The last question I, that the seven I said we talk about is this whole notion of employment. It's only since the Industrial Revolution that we've already considered our, our people started to look for a job where you work for somebody. Up before that, you may have apprenticed somewhere to learn a skill before you went out and started your own, I don't know, saddle company, uh, blacksmith or whatever. Or you be, you worked for your father because it was always the company would be Hugh Smith and Sons. And that was, that was very, very standard. So the industrial era changed our attitude and our perceptions of what we would do with occupation, that we would get a job as opposed to being totally responsible to ourselves for finding and creating work. And by the nature of work, it was a job, but we were self-employed. And I'm wondering whether, in fact, in the future, we're going to see that pendulum swing back or is in the process of swinging back today. I think that's an absolutely critical point that you've uh, captured here in this in this question, this topic, Gordon, because it, it also ties back into education. That, In a way, I think it can be argued that our entire educational system from kindergarten through Ph.D. level is aimed at creating um, people to work in either a factory scenario or an office scenario, which is like a white collar equivalent of a of a blue collar factory, and that that whole educational model may not be giving people the skills to um, to cr- become um, entrepreneurs and to become self sufficient and to take risks and and to learn the skills you need to do to create your own job. Exactly. Nobody's a bigger proponent of education than myself. But in many ways, education today has become a way of just institutionally certifying people so that they are qualified to get a job to work for somebody else. And even then, you're barely able to get yourself in the door. I don't think that was ever the intentions of education to be simply a vehicle for occupational training. It'll always be a very, very important one and accelerating one. But today, it's a lot more than that. It's how aggressive you are, how innovative you are, 
How much will, are you willing to take risk? How capable are you of thinking outside the box? All the kinds of things that have always been important, but today they've become critical. And you don't typically learn them in the classroom. But they can be learned. That also begs the question that education and how we think of education is going to change. Charles, we're up against our hard line here, and uh, I feel bothered that we didn't answer the question. We wanted to raise them. That was our, our goal, because there are very clear, I think, good answers. But maybe the thing that's most troubling to me is, why is nobody talking about this today? There's just nobody that's raising these. These, to me, seem to be the most fundamental questions facing our society today. Absolutely. And I am just guessing that part of it is fear that there's a, um, a, a social, uh, what we might call, um, failure of imagination. People cannot imagine a future other than, um, an extension of the last 50 years. And so they're terrified because they don't, they don't know what could, uh, arise to replace the current system. You now we're going into the future looking in the rear view mirror, aren't we? Yeah, And, uh, you know, the, uh, the kiss of death for any analyst is to project the future in a straight linear line because it doesn't work that way. It's never linear uh, for a period of time. Yes. And then it's suddenly there's an inflection point. And uh, we're at a, a clearly a major inflection point today, a paradigm that's trying to change, a change that we should embrace because it's 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 going to allow us as a as a world, as a globe to move to another level, to a higher standards of living. But we can't hide our head in the sand. We've got to address it and start working at it. And I'm afraid our leaders, they're just not doing it. Any last comments you'd like to make, uh, Charles, on this subject? No, I look forward to discussing um, these these uh, key questions and uh, in, in future shows. I know, Charles, uh, did, you've done a fair bit of writing, and I've got them up here now on this of solutions. And I encourage our listeners to go to your site and Read some about new employment model, new model of production, the uh, flex work kind of concept. But we'll talk about those in, in the future shows and, and bring them to the fore. But I, I challenge our listeners to, uh, to to think about this and to, to, to pay more attention because it's going to be one of the cornerstone issues facing us in the next 10 years in my, my assessment. Charles, could you tell our listeners how they could uh, actually get to your site and uh, to be able to do some of this readings. And by the way, uh, some of this, uh, these questions are answered in your uh, your latest book. Yeah, please uh, visit me at of2minds.com. And my latest book is called Why Things Are Falling Apart and What We Can Do About It. Talk to you uh, later on this week. And we're going to have another set of questions about the global end game that we want to continue to talk about. So uh, till then, talk to you later this week. Okay. Bye. This has been Gordon T. Long, editor and publisher of GordonTLong.com. New recordings are posted regularly and can be found at GordonTLong.com. New show notifications are available through RSS feed, iTunes, and other social networking venues at GordonTLong.com.